and but he had ridden on just the same, because pony riders were not allowed to stop and inquire into such things except when killed. <laughs> As long as they had life enough left in them, they had to stick to the horse and ride, even if the Indians had been waiting for them a week and were entirely out of patience. About two hours and a half before we arrived at Laparel Station, the keeper in charge of it had fired four times at an Indian, but he said with an injured air that the Indian had skipped around so as to spill everything, and ammunition's bland scarce, too. The most natural inference conveyed by this, by his manner of speaking was that in skipping around, the Indian had taken an unfair advantage. The coach we were in had a neat hole through its front, a reminiscence of its last trip through this region. The bullet that made it wounded the driver slightly, but he did not mind it much. He said the place to keep a man huffy was down on the southern overland among the Apaches before the company moved the stage line up on the northern route. He said the Apaches used to annoy him all the time down there, and that he came as near as anything to starving to death in the midst of abundance, because they kept him so leaky with bullet holes that he couldn't hold his vittles. This person's statements were not generally believed. We shut the blinds down very tightly that first night in the hostile Indian country, and lay on our arms. We slept on them some, but most of the time we only lay on them. We did not talk much, but kept quiet and listened. It was an inky black night and occasionally rainy. We were among woods and rocks, hills and gorges, so shut in, in fact, that when we peeped through a chink in a curtain, we could discern nothing. The driver and conductor on top were still, too, or only spoke at long intervals and low tones, as is the way of men in the midst of invisible dangers. We listened to raindrops pattering on the roof, and the grinding of the wheels through the muddy gravel, and the low wailing of the wind, and all the time we had that absurd sense upon us, inseparable from travel at night in a closed curtain vehicle, the sense of remaining perfectly still in one place, notwithstanding the jolting and swaying of the vehicle, the trampling of the horses and the grinding of the wheels. We listened a long time with intent faculties and bated breath. Every time one of us would relax and draw a long sigh of relief and start to say something, a comrade would be sure to utter a sudden hark, and instantly the experimenter was rigid and listening again. So the tiresome minutes and decades of minutes dragged away, until at last our tense forms filmed over with a dulled consciousness, and we slept, if one might call such a condition by so strong a name. For it was a sleep set with a hair trigger. It was a sleep seething and teeming with a weird and distressful, distressful confusion of shreds and fag ends of dreams. A sleep that was a chaos. Presently, dreams and sleep in the sullen hush of the night were startled by a ringing report and cloven by such a long, wild, agonizing shriek. Then we heard ten steps from the stage Help! 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 It was our driver's voice. Kill him! Kill him like a dog! I'm being murdered! Will no man lend me a pistol? Look out! Head him off! Head him off! Two pistol shots. A confusion of voices and the trampling of many feet, as if a crowd were closing and surging together around some object. Several heavy, dull blows as with a club. A voice that said appealingly, don't, gentlemen, please, don't. I'm a dead man. Then a fainter groan and another blow, and away sped the stage into the blackness and left the grisly mystery behind us. What a startle it was. Eight seconds would have amply covered the time it occupied. Maybe even five would do it. We only had time to plunge at a, at a curtain and unbuckle and unbutton part of it in an awkward and hindering flurry when our whip cracked sharply overhead and we went rumbling and thundering away down a mountain grade. We fed on that mystery the rest of the night, what was left of it, for it was waning fast. It had to remain a present mystery, for all we could get from the conductor in answer to our hails was something that sounded through the clatter of the wheels like, tell you in the morning. 
So we lit our pipes and opened the corner of a curtain for a chimney, and lay there in the dark listening to each other's story of how he first felt, and how many thousand Indians he first thought had hurled themselves upon us, and what his remembrance of the subsequent sounds was, and the order of their occurrence, and we theorized too, but there was never a theory that would account for our driver's voice being out there, nor yet account for his Indian murderers taking such good, talking such good English, if they were Indians. So we chattered and smoked the rest of the night comfortably away, our boating anxiety being somehow marvelously dissipated by the real presence of something to be anxious about. We never did get much satisfaction about that dark occurrence. All that we could make out of the odds and ends of the information we gathered in the morning was that the disturbance occurred at a station, that we changed drivers there, and that the driver that got off there had been talking roughly about some of the outlaws that infested the region. For there wasn't a man around there but had a price on his head and didn't dare show himself in the settlements, the conductor said. He had talked roughly about these characters and ought to have drove up there with his pistol cocked and ready on the seat alongside of him and begun business himself because any softy would know they would be laying for him. That was all we could gather and we could see that neither the conductor nor the new driver were much concerned about the matter. They plainly had little respect for a man who would deliver offensive opinions of people and then be so simple as to come into their presence unprepared to back his judgment as they pleasantly phrased the killing of any fellow being who did not like said opinions. And likewise, they plainly had a contempt for the man's poor discretion in venturing to rouse the wrath of such utterly reckless wild beasts as those outlaws. And the conductor added, I tell you, it's as much as Slade himself wants to do. This remark created an entire revolution in my curiosity. I cared nothing now about the Indians, and even lost interest in the murdered driver. There was such magic in that name, Slade. Day or night now, I stood always ready to drop any subject in hand to listen to something new about Slade and his ghastly exploits. Even before we got to Overland City, we had begun to hear about Slade and his division, for he was a division agent on the Overland. And from the hour we had left Overland City, we had heard drivers and conductors talk about only three things, California, the Nevada silver mines, and this desperado slave. And a, deal the mo and a deal the most of the talk was about Slade. We had gradually come to have a realizing sense of the fact that Slade was a man whose heart and hands and soul were steeped in the blood of offenders against his dignity. A man who awfully avenged all injuries, affronts, insults, or slights of whatever kind, on the spot if he could, years afterward if lack of earlier opportunity compelled it. A man whose hate tortured him day and night till vengeance appeased it. And not an ordinary vengeance either, but his enemy's absolute death. Nothing less. A man whose face would light up with a terrible joy when he surprised a foe and had him at a disadvantage. A high and efficient servant of the overland, an outlaw among outlaws, and yet their relentless scourge. Slade was at once the most bloody and most dangerous and the most valuable citizen that inhabited the savage fastness of the mountains. Chapter 10, History of Slade. A proposed fist fight, encounter with jewels, paradise of outlaws, Slade as superintendent, as executioner, a doomed whiskey seller, a prisoner, a wife's bravery, an ancient enemy captured, enjoying a luxury, hobnobbing with Slade, too polite, a happy escape. Really and truly, two-thirds of the talk of drivers and conductors had been about this man Slade ever since the day before we reached Julesburg. In order that the Eastern reader may have a clear conception of what a Rocky Mountain desperado is in his highest states of development, I will reduce all this mass of overland gossip to one straightforward narrative 
and present it in the following shape. Slade was born in Illinois of good parentage. At about 26 years of age, he killed a man in a quarrel and fled the country. At St. Joseph, Missouri, he joined one of the early California-bound immigrant trains and was given the post of train master. One day on the plains, he had an angry dispute with one of his wagon drivers and both drew their revolvers. But the driver was the quicker artist and had his weapon cocked first. So Slade said it was a pity to waste life on so small a matter and proposed that the pistols be thrown on the ground and the quarrel settled by a fist fight. The unsuspecting driver agreed and threw down his pistol, whereupon Slade laughed at his simplicity and shot him dead. He made his escape and lived a wild life for a while, dividing his time between fighting Indians and avoiding an Illinois sheriff who had been sent to arrest him for his first murder. It is said that in one Indian battle, he killed three savages with his own hand and afterward, afterward cut their ears off and sent them with his compliments to the chief of the tribe. Slade soon gained a name for fearless resolution, and this was sufficient merit to procure for him the important post of Overland Division Agent at Julesburg, in place of Mr. Jules removed. For some time previously, the company's horses had been frequently stolen, and the coaches delayed by gangs of outlaws who were wont to laugh at the idea of any man's having tem temerity to resent such outrages. Slade resented them promptly, the outlaws soon found that the new agent was a man who did not fear anything that breathed the breath of life. He made short work of all offenders. The result was that delays ceased. The company's property was let alone. And no matter what happened or who suffered, Slade's coaches went through every time. True, in order to bring about this wholesome change, Slade had to kill several men. Some say three, others say four, and others six. But the world was the richer for their loss. The first prominent difficulty he, he had was with the ex-agent Jules, who bore the reputation of being a reckless and desperate man himself. Jules hated Slade for supplanting him, and a good fair occasion for a fight was all he was waiting for. By and by, Slade dared to employ a man whom Jules had once discharged. Next, Slade se seized a team of stage horses which he accused Jules of having driven off and hidden somewhere for his own use. War was declared, and for a day or two, the two men walked warily about the streets, seeking each other. Jules armed with a double-barreled shotgun and Slade with his history-creating revolver. Finally, as Slade stepped into a store, Jules poured the contents of his gun into him from behind the door. Slade was plucked, and Jules got several bad pistol wounds in return. And both men fell and were carried to their respective lodgings. Both swearing the better aim should do deadlier work next time. Both swearing that better aim should do deadlier work next time. Both were bedridden a long time, but Jules got on his feet first and gathering his possessions together, packed them on a couple of mules and fled to the Rocky Mountains to gather strength and safety against the day of reckoning. For many months he was not seen or heard of and was gradually dropped out of the remembrance of all save Slade himself. But Slade was not the man to forget him. On the contrary, common report said that Slade kept a reward standing for his capture, dead or alive. After a while, seeing that Slade's energetic administration had restored peace and order to one of the worst divisions of the road, the Overland Stage Company transferred him to the Rocky Ridge Division in the Rocky Mountains to see if he could perform a like miracle there. It was the very paradise of outlaws and desperados. There was absolutely no semblance of law there. Violence was 